the meeting is now live. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this, the uh, Portsmouth NHS CCG Public Governing Board meeting, which is being held and streamed via Teams and on today, Wednesday, the 17th of March. It's uh, just after one o'clock. Uh, I need to indicate when you are ready. Uh, sorry, I need to inform you that um, I'm Andy Sylvester and I'll be chairing the meeting this afternoon. Uh, and I'm doing that as, as Dr. Elizabeth Fellows as today's centre. Apologies. We're meeting virtually in response to the limitations placed on governance by the COVID-19 pandemic. Members of the public have been invited to view this meeting via a link available from the CCG website. And papers for the meeting are also available via the same website. Today's meeting is being recorded so that in the event of a failure of technology, it can continue and will then be uploaded onto the CCG website as soon as possible. Bookmarks have been added to the pack of papers in order to identify agenda items. And board members are requested to keep their microphones on mute and to only turn these on when they are called to speak. Please only use the chat function to indicate that you wish to speak and do not use for questions or answers because this is a meeting in public and the public won't be able to see the chat function. I would therefore firstly like to uh, welcome Joe York who is attending as Innis Richards Deputy today. Uh, can I please ask everybody taking part to confirm that they are present? So I will call your name if you can just confirm you're here and you have good communications. So starting first with Helen Atkinson. Thank you. I'm here, Chair. Thank you. Uh, can you give your role as well, Helen, and, and everybody else, just as we know who you are? And what uh, yeah. Yes, because I'm sorry. I'm the uh, Helen Atkinson, the Director of Public Health for Portsmouth. Thank you. Karen Atkinson. Yeah, hi. Karen Atkinson, Governing Board Nurse for um, Portsmouth CCG. Thank you. Dr. Linda Colley. I'm present. I'm Chief Clinical Officer and Clinical Leader. Thank you. Margaret Geary. Yes, I'm a lay member of Portsmouth CCG. Thank you. Alison Jeffrey. Alison Jeffrey, Director of Children's Services for the City Council. <coughs> Dr. Carsten Leshaw. Um, uh, uh, good afternoon, my name is Carson Shaft. I'm a GP in Portsmouth and I'm one of the clinical executives with Portsmouth CCG. Thank you. Graham Love. Good afternoon, yeah, I'm Graham Love, I'm a lay member. Thank you. Jackie Powell. Hello, Jackie Powell, lay member for Portsmouth CCG. Thank you. David Scarborough. Good afternoon, yes, David Scarborough. I'm the uh, CCG's Practice Manager representative. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Simon Simonian. I'm Simon Simonian, I'm a GP, I'm one of the clinical exec. Thank you. Michelle Spanley. Hello, I'm Michelle Spanley, I'm the Chief Finance Officer for the CCG. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tawinda Apayal. Okay, we may get into the meeting later on. And David Williams. Hello, I'm David Williams. I'm Chief Executive of Portsmouth City Council. Thank you all very much. As I say, I'm Andy Swift. I'm a lab member and a deputy chair. Okay, so uh, we'll firstly start with the item number one, which is apologies for absence and welcome. So we have received apologies from Innes Richins. Uh, Dr. Nick Moore and Dr. Elizabeth Fellows. Item two is the register and declarations of interest. Uh, this is an opportunity for anyone to declare any conflicts of interest that they have in relation to the items on the agenda this afternoon. So if you could use the hand function if you wish to make any comments. That's good, I'll say there's no conflicts of interest. Uh, item three is minutes and actions of the previous meeting held on Wednesday, the 20th of January, 21. So I hope you have sight of, of those minutes. I'll take them page by page for accuracy, correctness and comment. So page one, page two, page three,
anything from the minutes? There's no indications. Okay. Um, just, uh, if if <coughs> there's no comments on the minutes, then can we agree those as a, as a correct set of minutes from the previous meeting? Yeah. Lots of nods and a yes. Thank you very much. Sorry, Graham, put his hand up. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Graham, yes. Please. Sorry, it's just a couple minor things, Andy. Yep. Um, yep. On page five, about halfway down, it talks about um, something Alison was saying. I think it's just a typo. We need to insert the word to, so it reads, would like to thank. Um, and then just on page seven, it refers to a question I asked, where I think it uses the phrase, no deal Brexit, when, of course, there is a... A deal to Brexit, so I think the no deal probably just needs to come out of that phrase. Thank you, Graham. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Right, with those amendments, we agree the minutes of the meeting. Yes. Thank you. Right, so that now takes us on to 3B to note the summary of actions. As you see, the table in front of you with five uh, agenda items on there. So the first one was 3A, the minutes of the previous meeting, quality and safeguard report. This was for Karen to action. Uh, yeah, as it says, I've had confirmation that there is now a, a, a SOP for um, mental health patients going in VD or contacting 111 first. Good. Thank you, Karen. Uh, item four was the Chief Clinical Officer's report, so consider including case studies or patient stories for future meetings. Um, there's an action on the, the Chair and Justina, and that, that will be considered for future meetings. Uh, again, item four, same report, to circulate proposed timelines of planning and priority setting. Uh, from Michelle, uh, we have them included in the March Governing Board papers. Thank you, Michelle. And at 6B, performance report, provide further information regarding the reduction of 21.1% in demand for 111 service, again included in the March Governing Board papers from Michelle. And at item 9, the Governing Board Assurance Framework, the GBAF, the Corporate Risk Register, deep dive to be undertaken by the Audit Committee, uh, the matter for Justina and myself, that will be undertaken by Audit Committee in due course and was discussed last week at the Audit Committee. So that's the completion of the summary of actions. Okay, so moving then on to item four, the Chief Clinical Officer's report. Dr. Linda Colley. Thank you. Um, so as usual, we've brought a paper here that summarises some of the key work that's been going on. I won't go through the whole thing, but I'll just pick out some key points. So the first thing I wanted to pick out is under item two, quality and safeguarding committee update. And it's really about this proposal for transformation of the Hampshire and Isle of Wight safeguarding function. So it the paper that was presented to that committee uh, provided an outline on the progress of Hampshire and Isle of Wight ICS and CCGs in looking at this project uh, and there's been a timeline established uh, to look at how our arrangements can be delivered moving forwards and it's just there for your information. The Primary Care Commissioning Committee uh, met uh, in January and the committee at that meeting uh, received a positive report from internal audit which concluded that they had substantial assurance about governance risk and contract processes used by the primary care team. Obviously there are recommendations and they have been actioned. Also they received a report from Healthwatch and I think it's really important that despite what's going on we are still having people looking into our services and making sure that we're doing things as best for public. This one was particularly looking at websites for the GP practices and they have picked out some points uh, that need identification and uh, help to fix. So some of them will be linked to the actual pandemic response and obviously the work for them will happen as soon as possible and then there are some uh, that perhaps can be picked up slightly later in the day but it's really about improving communication to the patients from the practices and so we welcome Health Watch's report on that. Uh, the CCG Renumeration Committee, so item four, made recommendations for extensions to the tenure of Dr Elizabeth Fellows and David Scarborough as a, a, and as elected posts. We are going back out to the practices to uh, assure that those recommendations are approved by the practice members and we'll uh, hopefully hear back from them shortly. 
In addition, we considered a workforce disability equality standard, which will be required to report against in 21-22. And the committee recommended that actually, uh, in support of this, a disability awareness session would be arranged for us as a governing board. And we thought that would be a good topic for a future development session. So we look forward to having that in our programme over this next year. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight was uh, the white paper. So the integration and innovation working together to improve health and social care for all was a paper that was released on the 11th of February 21. And it outlines a proposal that is taken to Parliament to become law as a health and care bill. And it's just a list of the key proposals there. Having obviously reviewed this, this is the direction of travel we've been going on already. It is part of our natural journey, but we will look forward to working through what this means uh, for moving forward. We have briefed the CCG staff at a team briefing, uh, and we are providing updated information on the CCG's intranet. And as things become clearer, we intend to continue to do that. As you know, the Ship Priorities Committee meet to regularly review policies that we can adopt across the whole patch, and the latest policy statements have been uh, reviewed by the Clinical Advisory Group and are listed on this paper for your information. They have been recommended to be approved. And the last thing I was going to pick up on is the governance review. So as you know, we've been uh, jointly commissioned a uh, governance review between ourselves and NHS England, and it's coming to the uh, conclusions around this time. We will be reviewing a draft report shortly and any recommendations and making an action plan. And I was hoping that we could propose that the audit committee, as our senior scrutiny committee of the CCG, are delegated to oversee this action plan once it's produced and report progress back to us as a board. So that's the thing on this paper that I'm asking for approval for. Is everyone happy with that as an approach? Yes. Yeah, lovely. So I've got nods. There's a question from Graham, I believe. Margaret, question. The question from Graham. The hands disappeared, so maybe not. Yeah, Sorry. And I, I was just going to ask the question about the safeguarding timeline, and I know um, that um, our safeguarding boards are keen to. I make representations to the project uh, managers, but well, was there a consultation about the timeline? I will have to go back and find out that, Margaret. I don't know. I don't know if Karen knows as chair of the Quality and Safeguarding Committee. Was that discussed, Karen? I'm I'm not sure that there was. I know that we were um, involved to some extent but not as fully as we'd like to have been so I'm not so sure there has been. I know that the paper itself Margaret is going to the Safeguarding Adults Board in Portsmouth and the Children's Safeguarding Board um, but I don't think, I think we have concerns about the timeline um, and that it's too quick. I think so that, that's one of our um, the things we're going to raise from a Portsmouth perspective. Yeah. Just, uh, it was just a genuine question about were we involved in, in agreeing this timeline? Yeah, yeah, doesn't sound right. Okay, thank you. And a question from Jackie. Hello, mine is probably linked to uh, Margaret's was around the safeguarding and that the immediate priority was to get to align designated professional roles, nurses and doctors, I was trying to work out, would that be one across the whole of Hampshire and Isle of Wight CCG or what, what's the structure for getting the requisite number of um, designated professional roles? Do we know yet? I don't think the paper, well, yeah, no, the paper doesn't, isn't specific about the um, number of roles, although I think the team are aware. Um, I think they're looking at more than one. I think it's, I think there's quite an expansion of staff and there's some concerns about how we'll fill those roles. Um, so I, I don't think they're talking about one. I think they're talking about many, but um, I haven't seen the specific details. Would that be something that's helpful to you then, Karen, from what yeah. I'm hearing? see some of the details so that we know where this because there's such important roles where will they sit within local places yeah. yeah. like I said from a Portsmouth perspective we we still need to tease it all out a bit because we're not confident that we completely understand the implications for, for Portsmouth 
are there opportunities to do that teasing out? I, I, I do know that it's been agreed at the Hampshire Isle of Wight Quality Board, um, but Portsmouth haven't agreed it. So um, we're hoping that if it goes to the Adult Safeguarding Board and the Children's Safeguarding Board, that it will that we'll be able to take um, recommendations from them back um, to the lead. I think it's being led by Julia Barton on behalf of the CCGs. Okay, thank and you. So get that opportunity. And as you say, Karen, I think traditionally these roles have been quite difficult to fill. It's quite yes. a specialist area, and so looking yeah. at how we're going to be sustainable is really important. But yeah. we do need to make sure our voice is heard in that. So, yeah. welcome any feedback. I think that was everything, Chair. Thank you, Linda. Uh, that's very helpful. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, so are we? Uh, are the board content to accept Clint Wilson's report? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Next item then is item five, the health and care Portsmouth COVID-19 update. So Helen, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I will just share some slides uh, with you. Thank you. So this is the usual regular COVID-19 intelligence summary that uh, we present at the governing board meeting. And just to say, we'll share the slides after, but also we do publish the set of sl these sets of uh, slides on a Friday on the Portsmouth City Council website as well for four people. So we're going to cover a little bit on infections, hospital pressure, deaths and vaccinations. And I would just show this, uh, I know you can't read it or see it, but it just reminds people that some of the information is quite sensitive. So just for that, that caveat, and now I'll start with the presentation. All good news, um, which is great, is that um, we continue to see a reduction in the infection rate across uh, Portsmouth and also across the Hampshire and Isle of Wight area and regionally as we are seeing nationally. This just gives the, um, shows you here that we've just coming out of, as we get through March, out of the second wave, wave which peaked in early January. And um, then this shows the spark lines. And again, this just splits it down to Hampshire, uh, Isle of Wight, Portsmouth, and Southampton. And you'll see there that we have had 13,985 cases totally since the beginning of the pandemic. And we have seen 129 new cases in the last seven days. You'll see, see there the data for the other areas. And this nicely gives a, um, this slide gives a nice comparator. So on the left hand side, you'll see the map of England. And what you'll see now is quite a lot of green and blue. I think last time we presented, I presented last month, you saw a lot of what we would see dark red and deep reds there across the whole country. But we're now seeing, which is great, the lower infection rates across the whole country and um, just with some areas that are seen as having uh, enduring transmission which is met, which are mainly in North East, North West and some in the Midlands. But again, on the right hand side, you'll see there the comparators in terms of the rate per 100,000 in the last seven days and then the percentage change. Now, if, you, if I'd shown you this a week ago, you would have seen throughout um, very healthy reductions uh, in terms of the percentages of about uh, 40 to 50 percent. You'll see now that a few of them are slowing down and actually even in Portsmouth, Southampton, and slow there, you'll see a slight increase. It's important to note though, now that the numbers uh, are much, much lower. So obviously a few few weeks ago at the peak, we were seeing rates per 100,000 over 200, that, uh, 200 cases per 100,000 was now we're seeing much, much less. And when you've got smaller numbers of infections, like the Isle of Wight there at 16.2 and the like per 100,000 last seven days, that any, small change or uh, an outbreak in a school or a care home really shifts that percentage change. So just to note that. But again, you'll see there, Portsmouth is coming down nicely at 61.9. Um, and uh, uh, we're still slightly just over the England average there, but uh, above the southeast. But there are still areas in the country, like Bradford mentioned there as a comparator, that are still seeing fairly uh, high levels. But I think it's important to note that we are now 
um, in the first step of the government roadmap coming out of lockdown and schools have as you know returned and we'll probably start to see this returned in the main about a, um, uh, a week ago we're starting to probably see that as more people come out of the stay at home message uh, the more people are out and mixing we might start to see an increase in the infection um, it's only to be expected as we move forward so um, this is a, a chart just shows you the new variants. I'll just pull out two points to um, to make. So currently, nationally, I know there's a lot of media coverage about new variants, but currently nationally, the predominant um, variant across all regions um, are, is still the UK variant. So again, in Portsmouth, we are seeing um, that of about 96.9% of cases in the last week but it's been pretty much high in the 90s since uh, December um, and even before that and what we know about the UK variant is that it is more transmissible. Then the left hand side just to, to note that there are as there have been actually since the beginning of the pandemic you see quite a lot of uh, variant changes it's fairly normal in a pandemic but the area that uh, the variant that people are talking about a lot is the South African variant, and you'll see there there's still quite an, um, a few number of cases nationally, and that doesn't the cases don't seem to be increasing hugely. So we've only seen eight more since the last update. And the important message, of course, is that we know that uh, as research continues, that uh, all of the current variants in the UK are um, the current vaccines being used in the vaccination program are effective in terms of a um, antibody, um, rather a, um, an, a, 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 an effective antibody response. So that's good. Then quickly going, I'll go through the age bands. You'll see here, much like the spark lines at the beginning, we continue to see uh, a reduction. And you see there in March, all of the age bands are coming down, which is really positive. One of the areas we always have concern about is the over 60s. And you'll see the red line when, you know, was up there, it particularly um, over 80s, because that age group are more likely to end up as in a hospital admission. But because we're down at such small numbers now, you're starting to see quite um, blips with we have outbreaks in care homes. Uh, uh, so that's why that line went up a bit, but it's now coming down again. So nicely, uh, infection rates come down across all age groups. And this is just showing you the younger age groups. And again, there, you'll see that, um, uh, uh, they, that they've come down across all of the uh, age bands. But we've not really had, and it's important to note, um, very high infection rates, particularly in the, the one to four or the naught to four year age group. But what we are starting, to, what we tend to see is uh, uh, higher infection rates across the uh, young adults and working age adults, partly because they are more likely to be out and about. And then quickly, I'll just go over the hospital pressures. So uh, what we are now seeing is a reduction in the pressure across the uh, Portsmouth Hospital Trust, although there are still quite uh, reasonably high numbers of uh, patients in the QA with COVID. So although pressure is much reducing there, you can see on the graph, there are still pressures within the hospital um, in terms of admissions, as well as patients in critical care. And then quickly, just to cover this, is an improving picture in, in terms of deaths. There have been 276 COVID-related deaths within um, 28 days of positive tests recorded in Portsmouth since the end of October. But that's reducing now, and we are, we've are we only had three deaths in the last seven days, giving the total 356 deaths in total. So that is an improving picture. And then just finally, just to show you some of the vaccine uptake data for Portsmouth. So again, really good um, news here. We are seeing across the whole of Hampshire and Isle of Wight really um, good uptake rates. And this just shows you obviously through the age bands and the one to nine cohorts, you'll see they're all increasing in terms as each of the cohorts comes online in terms of the invites going out we're seeing really really good uptake overall which is a really good news story because what we want to see obviously is all um, 
adults that are offered the vaccination taking it up so that we have really really high vaccination uptake rates because that is the way we will be able to move out of uh, lockdown and back to uh, any kind of new normal so I'll leave it there thank you and I will unshare slides Helen, <clears throat> thank you very much for that extremely useful uh, questions Linda first off Sorry, I was just trying to unmute myself. Um, I don't know whether it's for Helen or for Alison. I just wondered, with the return to schools, have we seen a good level of uptake of the lateral flow testing for the pupils? And it doesn't look like on those lines we're seeing an increase in cases in terms of asymptomatic carriage, but I just wondered how it's gone. Uh, Alison, do you want me to start and then you might want to join in so yes we we've got school testing obviously for secondary schools that's uh, pupils and staff and then for primary uh, schools it's staff and the the schools have completed the pre school starting three lateral flows and now have got access to lateral flow uh, device testing kits at home and also the good thing the good news is that there is community collect scheme for bubbles around uh, family bubbles of children who have gone back to school as well and those can be picked up at our local testing sites in Portsmouth so good uptake on testing and we have had a um, small number of cases identified through the lateral flow testing which is really why it's there and in place and also very good news is that um, nurseries uh, have already gone live in the uh, testing but private nurseries also will be going live on the 18th of March so some really good news around testing uh, opportunities there for in the school Alison you might want to well just to add to that thank you Helen um, schools have been really pleased with the high level of engagement by parents and and children in testing in secondary schools um, but you know the it's over 90 percent in terms of the uh, agreement to be to be part of this and uh, and do those regular tests so uh, that's as, as good as we could have hoped for I think chair could we um, perhaps put a documented thank you to all the schools for the amendous work they've done as well as colleges and universities to keep to get the kids back at school uh, and to do this program because it's no small undertaking and we really do appreciate as a health body that they're supporting us in this uh, Linda, absolutely, yes, yes. I think the whole board will endorse that comment as well. So thank you, yes, for noting. Okay, any other questions for Helen? No? Okay, thank you very much. Right, I'll move now on to item six, which is a verbal update uh, from David Williams on the health and care system. Thank you, David. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, and the I know the agenda refers to an attached document. That, that was a, a, a draft document that we're still working on, and that has been uh, withdrawn from publication. But what we're doing, uh, and there's a huge amount of effort going into this, we're working very closely with our partners, both across Health and Care Port, Port, Portsmouth, uh, Portsmouth South East Hants, uh, ICP, and the ICS. Um, looking to explain and refine our own operating uh, model, um, both currently and coming into the new system um, under the white paper. Uh, we're looking to refine that. We're looking to give expression to our aspirations um, and our determination to improve health outcomes for um, our population. Um, and we're doing that both in terms of the prospect of a transition period before the legislation changes and how we will operate um, post that legislative um, change. And I think um, Linda referred earlier to the, to the publication of the white paper um, earlier this year. So we're looking at our interface with all those different bits of the system. Some of those themselves are also in the process of changing. Um, so at times it's a little bit like nailing jelly to the wall, um, but we are getting there. I think it will be a very useful document both for ourselves and for our partners so that they can clearly um, see not only how we operate, but also what we believe in um, and, and what, why we show the determination um, that we do. I have to say that I think you know, albeit only in draft, I think the work demonstrates that um, 
as a CCG here in Portsmouth. We're in a very strong position um, and have been for some time uh, pressing really on the objectives that are now finding expression in the white paper, um, particularly in terms of broader and deeper integration across um, health and social care, um, but also with a focus on um, engaging and supporting the community at place. And the white paper does refer to place as uh, most generally referring to that around the local authority uh, boundary, which for us is the, is the city of Portsmouth, where we, 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 we fortunately share um, a boundary. So I think that we'll continue with that work. Um, I hope, Board, that you will find that a, a helpful um, document. Um, I'm sure that it will evolve um, over time, but I think particularly given that there is so much change going on in the in the system, it's really important that we are able to give expression um, to what we stand for, how we will engage, uh, and our enthusiasm for engaging on those broader geographies and broader agendas across the Hampshire and Isle of Wight um, system. Um, our efforts in doing this um, have been well received. We've had a lot of encouragement from partners. Um, they have found what they've seen to date uh, to be very useful and we're working closely with them to, to further refine that. So I'm very happy um, to answer any questions. I thought um, Linda referred earlier to the work that uh, PwC have been doing. Uh, I know that's only in draft at this stage, but I thought it was very encouraging uh, that they had identified the huge um, commitment um, that this board shows to working um, on those broader geographies as well as within our own city. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, the update is, is noted. Uh, questions and comments? Karen. I just wanted to know, um, you may say it, Dave, sorry, if we, if we knew when the board would could see a copy of the document when we'd actually when the document be final well i think yeah that will be a decision for the board i guess but we will we will get a revised draft out to you very shortly we're we're, we're working on it at the moment karen okay thank you that's karen dave scarborough thank you chair uh, my, my question um is is really as when we've discussed this type of thing before from you know sitting in a in a in a primary care um on on the ground i think what's been really important um throughout the covid pandemic is where we found the commission support to be um as, as we've worked through it I, I think what i'm keen to understand is what that will look like at the end of the transition and i appreciate you know there is a lot of change going on but when can we realistically expect to be able to see what that structure will look like and where that support um, will continue to sit I guess Dave that a lot of that will depend on what we actually see in initially in the bill uh, that follows on um, from the white paper and how in each system um, the encouragement from the white paper uh, to delegate significantly to place um, both in terms of budget but also in terms of focus on local communities and finding solutions that meet local needs you know how exactly that is translated now I think that we have a really good opportunity to shape that for ourselves and I think we should take take on that opportunity fully and that's one of the reasons why we're so keen to be engaging both at the ICS level and also with the Portsmouth South East Hans ICP. Thank, thank you. Just, just as a follow-up to that, I, I think this may be in, in the draft when it, when it comes out. Um, would there be a, an initial, um, I think the word I'm looking for is transitional structure um, from the CCG and, and the City Council and I'll, I'll use the example of where individual directors are going to sit um, we, we have had a couple of gaps um, recently into an, in the current structure and, and it's really what that structure will look like um, as we transit through the next year yeah, we're in we're in the process of filling filling those gaps, and actually, we're encouraged to do so by the PwC um, report. Actually, um, in terms of the um, the interface between what will be two CCGs across Hampshire and Isle of Wight, we've just seen published the uh, the board membership of the new Hampshire Southampton Isle of Wight CCG, 
and clearly our own CCG. It's proposed that there will be a strategic commissioning board that will be made up of representatives of both of those two um, CCGs. Um, clearly, it's, it's envisaged that we will have a, we will share an accountable um, officer. Um, so I think, um, Dave, that we will get good representation on that board, but until its terms of reference um, are established and we know what those agendas are going to look like, um, it's, it's difficult to say precisely who will be um, on that board. But I, th I think we're, we're in a strong position. Um, I think we're, we're covering uh, well, um, the the sort of sad gaps that we've uh, that we've got at the moment, but we've got a strong team, um, and I'm very confident that we will be able to play a very very full part, and we'll be able to continue to improve services for our residents. Thank you. Thank you, David. Jackie. Thank you, sir. I was having trouble unmuting. I fully endorse what um, David's just said. My uh, kind of feelings around some of it is that I think it's really important, however this comes out, that we keep our staff and public engaged and on board and understanding what we're doing and that if they have every opportunity to work for whatever position there is across the three or systems or tiers. And... and are with us and understand. That's it. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Margaret. You're on mute, Jackie. Uh, Margaret. Margaret, you're on mute. Oh, that's doing that. Um, I, I, uh, I'm just checking that as we ask the paper or the document that you're working on, um, for Health and Care Portsmouth continu continues, are you expecting to be much clearer about how the ICS and the ICP see their, what their expectations are of those particular partnerships vis-a-vis -vis Portsmouth? Yeah, we're, well, we're certainly hoping so, Margaret, and I think part of the dialogue that we're having both with the ICP and with the ICS um, is is helping us articulate that. But, uh, you know, as I think is, in, you know, inferred in your in your question, it's a two way street. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we need some clarity from those other parts um, to help us understand how best we fit in as well as them asking us for clarity about how we're going to engage and I think that you know that's uh, in a way that's the beauty of the uh, of the dynamic that we've got um, going on um, at, at the moment and I think just picking up on Jackie's point about um, you know the, 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 the focus and emphasis for our, our residents I think you know I think one of the benefits of us trying to codify this in a document and it always is more difficult when you try to <laughs> try to write it down or draw it out but you know it, it could be quite easy for the public to think that um, you know the, the creating uh, a statutory thing across the whole of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight um, is an odd way of setting about greater devolution and I think we need to be able to demonstrate to, to our residents how their voice um, will be heard and a focus, you know, as I said earlier about about place and about solutions that 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 fit the place that we're that we're serving, um, can actually um, you know f f find support in that bigger system, and and that's really what we're we're looking at. Thank you, David. Uh, Linda. Yeah, so mine's really going back to what Dave said about the support for primary care. I think we have done some good work through COVID in making sure primary care um, is heard. Uh, and we definitely don't want to go backwards from that. We'd like to build on that. I think the other point is we have quite a lot of voices now for primary care. If you think about the PCN clinical directors, we've got the PPCA directors, we've got ourselves as clinical executives. And what we need to work on is how are we going to galvanise those voices and how are we going to represent ourselves across the various levels to make sure our voice is loud and heard, but we're not all having to traipse to the same meeting. So that is a piece of work that needs to happen. Thank you, Linda. Okay, anything else? Anybody else? Comments or otherwise? No? Good. David, thank you very much for the... Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, item 7 then brings us on to the finance and performance reports. We'll start with 7A, which is the finance report for uh, uh, N10, I believe. Yep, mark yeah. 10. So, Michelle. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so in front of you, you um, have seen the month 10 uh, finance statements. Um, in terms of order of my uh, reports, I'd like to do the perform finance report, then the performance report, and then we'll talk about the uh, future looking reports, if that's okay with everybody. So if we do the uh, finance paper, um, uh, as I say, month 10, we were on track to achieve the um, forecasted surplus position. And I can confirm that we have closed down month 11 and we remain on track to achieve uh, the 3.3 million pounds surplus position. The CCG has received its respective it is retrospective, can't speak today, retrospective uh, top-ups for the hospital discharge program and we've also got some prospective allocation for that of 80% um, uh, uh, of expected costs. So from a point of view of certainty, we've got a little bit more certainty now around us actually achieving um, the £3.3 million surplus position. We continue to work with our colleagues, Ports and City Council, to make sure that the hospital discharge programme is represented correctly um, in our um, claims that we make, um, and, and in particular because that changes our expenditure profiles uh, across our normal budget position. So um, continuing healthcare, for example, you'll see um, as an underspend um, in our books currently, but that's because uh, quite a number of our normal patients are, are sat within the hospital discharge programme. And I also just wanted to say that, you know, the team have worked really hard over the last year to keep on top of all the changes that we've um, had to grapple with in the finance world, but also on top of that, managing the cash position because we had to try and pay our suppliers uh, quick, more quickly, um, and we've done really well in that arena, and also just to manage our cash balance um, to its usual postage stamp status uh, by the end of uh, March um, and I'm pleased to say that we're on track to achieve that as well. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm going to say much. Graham? Thanks, Michelle. I, um, I think you may have answered this in, in the outline, but on the more detailed breakdown, I see that mental health commissioning is actually underspent, where I was expecting it to be overspent. Is that because we've got quite a lot of money that's going to come through, expenditure that's going to come through later that you prepared for? Or? Um, I, I think that's also partly to do with the hospital discharge program as well, Graham. So a number of those clients have gone through the hospital discharge program process and therefore our normal expenditure rates um, are skewed this year as a result of that. Um, so it's going to be really difficult to try and compare year on year when we, when we get to that position. But yeah, we're really mindful of making sure we understand the patient flows and, and equally just so that people are aware that the teams are trying to make sure that those patients although they're on that hospital discharge program, they're getting the right care at the right time and then moving on from, from that uh, position as well into the care that they should be receiving. So we do, we've got one eye on the fact that that hospital discharge program will stop um, at some point. Our understanding is it's still gonna stop on 31st of March um, with a six week lag. So we just need to make sure that we're aware of that because that expenditure then changes when patients or clients end up in, in services that they require on an ongoing basis. So yes, Graham, it is, it is related to the hospital discharge programme and that slight change of focus um, for this financial year. Thank you. Uh, Alison. Thanks, Andy. Um, Michelle, at our January meeting, um, we discussed the need to establish a process for considering applications for investments yeah as we can be looked in principle at one uh, on, around uh, integrated children's nursing mm -hmm. um, is there any update on how and when those investment proposals which are about the sort of long-term resilience of the mm -hmm. whole system in fact that one is very much a Portsmouth and Southeast Hampshire proposal um, how, how those are going to be decided 
So shall I, can we talk about that at the, when we talk about 21-22 papers rather than the finance? Because sure. I, yeah, 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 sorry. I don't have a specific answer to you, but it just helps in terms of where we are and, and what the next... Of course. Is. Yeah, of course. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Is that everything um, for the financial report? So we're asked to accept the report. Are we happy to do that as a board? We are. That's great, thank you. Okay, 7B then, uh, Michelle, financial framework. Um, uh, actually, um, if I may, uh, Chair, can I just can I do a normal sort of performance report? Yes. That's sort of like a here and now as well, isn't it? Um, yeah, and then thank you. I'll put the other two papers together because okay. they, they go hand in hand, really. Right. So, so 7C. Um, so, yeah, so if I just do uh, my normal sort of brief update in terms of where we are on performance. Um, uh, as we've been reporting, we, we continue to report against the national standards um, uh, set in terms of our performance indicators. Um, and, and you'll see that the report actually shows a, 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 a good... A, a, you know, a good achievement against those national um, standards, despite us being in a pandi pandemic uh, situation. So it's it's good to see that um, still continuing as as the months go by as well. Jackie, you uh, asked a question at the last board um, about the the comparison for one one one, and I'm not entirely sure we answered the question within the within the report. But what the report was trying to show last time round was a comparison month on month. It was the change between one month to the next. And I think it was really to highlight the fact that it's really difficult for the service at this moment in time to predict what um, activity they're going to see. And therefore, it becomes really difficult to predict how much, how much service to put on um, in terms of um, responding to that, to that demand. So hopefully that, that sort of helps. Um, in understanding um, and also in our understanding then for the response times and, and trying to understand how the service is, is responding um, to that fluctuation. Uh, sometimes they get it right and sometimes it's more difficult, um, I think, um, as, as we go through the period. But also key with 111 call service because we've, we're doing the uh, 111 first um, expansion aren't we so we are really all over that in terms of making sure that the response times are appropriate and that it dovetails into um, our emergency response too. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that the covering sheet mentions 111 call answering times, the elective performance indicators, um, referral to treatment and in particular the 52 week waits um, and diagnostic patients as well. Um, uh, and in terms of national cancer targets, I just also wanted to add to the paper that's in front of you to say that it looks like compared to national mean, we're doing really well in our patch as well. And, and I'll try and make sure that that's updated uh, in the next board paper so that you can, we can all understand that we know that we did, we have been trying to continue with the cancer standards as best we can and the report certainly indicates that we're doing quite well um, uh, but we're also doing quite well if you were then to look at it from a national perspective. Um, I'm going to stop talking there and, and take questions if that's okay. Thank you Michelle. Any questions or comments? Jackie. Thank you Michelle for um, answering me on the 111 that was really helpful because the other Big one that I think stands out in the in the performance is of course just RTT, mm. and it's hard to think how we get that back on track. I don't know what the plans are. I don't know how mm. it's beginning. Have you got any sense of when that could be even remotely where it needs to be? Um, I, I I would struggle to answer that in its entirety, Jackie. Other than I know that. The teams are trying to turn their attention to uh, switching back on as much elective activity as they can, um, where they can, because of the issues um, around COVID patients uh, within, certainly within PHU. I'm glad that Jo's um, put her hand up. Hopefully, she'll be able to help me a little bit more as well. Um, and we're also still awaiting some update in terms of the national money that's being set aside 
for um, RTT recovery um, going forward. So, um, as I say, we're all over it. I'm going to then turn to Joe in in order to hopefully answer my uh, answer that question a little bit more fully. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll try. Um, again, I think as you said, Michelle, I think from the first wave we, we did quite a lot of work both as a local system at the ICP but feeding into Hampshire and the Isle of Wight um, around our recovery plans and, and how we could get those back on track. Obviously then we had the, the second wave of um, over the winter and, and saw much more of an impact on health services and particularly, I have to recognise PHU as we've seen had, had much higher um, COVID patients in, in the hospital than, than perhaps some other areas. So that, that will impact, has impacted both on our ability to deliver that, that wave one plan, if you like, around recovery, but also in terms of how we can then get that back on track. So some of those backlogs will have increased because we had to stand down um, elective provision over the winter. Um, so I think the, the recovery planning this this time will be led by the Instant Control Centre across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight um, to come to get us out of the, the pandemic response. I think everyone is very mindful that we need to think about the workforce and the toll this has taken on the workforce and again particularly for us in Portsmouth where we've seen those higher um, rates than perhaps other areas in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight that is going to impact on our capacity to to get back up and running as quickly as maybe we we would have expected to but also we have to keep thinking about what's that infection rate and the rate of hospitalizations because that will continue to impact so um, that said I think the recovery will need to be planned really carefully again across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight and we also need to think about how we continue to use um, some of the independent sector capacity as well. And again, at a regional and national basis, how we work those contracts much in a much more aligned way that support the, the acutes to, to get that recovery on track. And also looking at alternatives and different pathways. And we were doing a lot of that anyway already in Portsmouth. We're one of the leading areas for advice and guidance that has really improved um, making sure people only go to get referred to hospital when when they need to and also now starting to think about can we use that methodology as well or something similar around follow-up appointments as well so you know that we're managing demand in a in a better way so that we've really got the right pathways in place for, to support GPs and patients. Thank you so much appreciated. Thank you Joe. Uh, Graham, question. Thanks Andy. Um, appreciate Michelle what you said that you bring some information into a future meeting which would be a bit more detailed around cancer so if you want to defer this question to then I will understand it but um, I just want to check that obviously really pleasing to see the cancer performance but I just wondered is that off the back of a generally lower rate of referral than compared to pre-pandemic um, or, or is it a relatively similar level? Um, very good question, Graham, and I and I will defer to answer it because I would be guessing if if um, if I was to try, other than to say that we're still achieving higher than the national mean. So I think we're, you know, in terms of still making sure that we're focusing in on the right patients. I think it's it's worthwhile saying that, um, uh, and, and that people are are being treated. Um, uh, yeah, within those within those nationally set um, um, targets, so I think it's a good thing. But I will I will go back and I'll ask that specific question because I think it's a very pertinent question. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Linda. I just wanted to mention that obviously if people are waiting a long time there is a lot of work goes on to make sure they're clinically safe to do so. I think that's really important just to mention. So it's not just about how long somebody's been on a list, it's about the appropriateness of that wait and the urgency. Thank you Linda, that's helpful to know. Okay, are there any other items then for the performance report? So can we accept the contents of the performance report? Board? 
Good. Thank you. Okay, Michelle, back to you. Lovely. So, thank you. Yes, um, I'll take the, the the other two papers together because, like I said earlier, they they sort of are hand in hand. So one is one is focused on the financial framework, um, and the other is around the planning that goes behind making sure that we are able to complete that financial framework. So if if, if we take it in that vein, hopefully um, it will make more sense. So both papers are really a point in time. It's sort of like where where we've got to, what we are expecting to happen whilst we wait for national guidance to be issued. We're, we're still awaiting further national guidance um, and I'm told that that might be towards the end of March, but I haven't, I don't yet know if that is going to be coming our way. Um, and at the time of writing the report, um, the expectation was that for the, at least for the first three months of 21-22, we'd still be in um, this, the, the financial regime that we've been in for 2021. Uh, with the exception of the hospital discharge program. Um, so I would already outlined that we're expecting that to stop um, uh, currently. That might change, but that's where that's where we are at this moment in time. What we're also hearing is that the three month approach may well be extended into a half year approach, but I have no confirmation of that as yet. Um, so we are waiting the guidance. Um, uh, as I said as well about the hospital discharge program, we continue to work with our uh, council colleagues just to make sure that we're treating patients appropriately through that system so that people don't get stuck, which we have seen in the past. So that's all very good news. Um, and we're still awaiting further guidance around the extra monies on mental health and elective. So it would be really, really good to understand um, what what the expectations are around those two areas so that we can get on with um, recovery and the additional um, activity if um, or, or as required. Um, so both papers got a timeline in it, timelines of what work we're expecting to do uh, whilst we wait for the national guidance um, and our teams are working on uh, business cases, as we've heard from Alison, and we, and we took some business cases, didn't we, into our conversation at the last board. Uh, and also the um, ICP has been working on discharge to assess uh, business cases, as well as the 111 first and the TRUE programme. So, you know, it, all of those pieces of work need to uh, form part of our financial framework going forward. Um, and in terms of how are we doing with our forecasting and looking forward? If we uh, look at what we're expecting to spend compared to our previously published allocation, we would be in the realms of needing to look for about eight million pounds worth of uh, efficiencies, which is which is probably where we would have been um, in previous years as well. So there's no surprise there. Um, I think. Probably, as far as I can go in terms of the papers themselves, they're here as a. This is what we're. This is what we're doing. This is what. This is how we think we'll be able to take things forward. Um, but until I, until we understand the financial regime going forward, it's it's quite difficult to tell you any any anything further with any certainty. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, there's a couple of questions. Carsten, over to you. Just, just, <clears throat> just a query. These, um, these eight million pound efficiencies. Mm -hmm. um, is that, <clears throat> is that an anomaly, or is that something that's come up in 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 recent uh, 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 in recent times? And and of course, is this something that would would hamper or jeopardize our recovery? Um, I mean, some of the, the you know the stuff that we've we've already paid for for activities that the hospital hasn't provided and um, mm. how, how do we how do we now recoup that or how do we now get um, efficiency efficiencies and and recovery without having to to spend extra and this and this is something that that always comes up isn't it the pot isn't endless uh, mm. but we need to get those people who are 
who should have been doing the work and obviously they couldn't I understand that um, to now sort of figure out ways of of doing it because I mean often it, it sort of lands back in in primary care and this is sort of I, I slightly worry about about that okay thank, thank you Carsten so in terms of um, a financial framework having to find some some efficiencies is not a new um, Phenomenon, phenomenon, can't even say that word. <laughs> it's not new to us. Um, we, uh, what, and the way that we need to approach that is, is by having uh, other initiatives that would mean that it, because basically what you say is if you do, if we're going to keep doing the same, we'll have an eight million pound problem. And then we need to say, well, it, we know we're going to end, end up with an eight million. How do we avoid that level of growth, etc.? So, that's the sort of next stage that we need to go through, and part of that's already, you know, is already there. The answer answers are probably already there, given that we've done so much work on the discharge to assess program, we've done so much on the true program, etc. It's all about. So if we spend a little bit more there, we should make some savings here, and therefore we don't need to set aside quite so much money. Let's give an example to to Portsmouth hospitals because actually we're going to do a discharge to assess program and therefore they won't need to see as many patients. Yeah, so that's the sort of next step that we need to make sure that we have with the business cases and, and part of the conversation we were having last time uh, around some of the ones that came forward um, uh, at, at the governing board uh, last uh, in January. Thank you Michelle. Uh, Linda. Yeah, so I suppose if there's a level of uncertainty, do we as a board need to have a conversation about going at risk on some of these items? So if we think the business cases are good and sound and we think for Portsmouth it's the right thing to do, does the conversation have to shift to saying, OK, well, we're going to go at risk to do these because they're so important and we'll have to sort out the finances once we know more clarity? I know it's a risky thing, Michelle, but yeah, that's just my thoughts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, and a very good a uh, very good question, Linda. Um, so open to open to debate. I mean, it's not, it's not like we don't know about these things, is it? Um, uh, and we are in a, a very strange financial regime. Uh, and I would suggest maybe if if we were to go down that route, as long as we're clear about what we're making a decision on going forward, that you know doesn't run away with us. We 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 could probably be in that position. If it was the right, you know, if we all agree it was the right thing to do because we, we think it is the, the next step that we need to take. Thank you, Michelle. David. Yeah, Michelle, I mean, with, without us um, ending up on a very well-worn naughty step, I mean, I am concerned about the, you know, the delay because it's, it's, it's delay to us improving services for our local residents. Um, and I do, you know, is there any route that we can at least voice our frustration um, with this? Because it's Portsmouth residents who are suffering as a consequence. You know, you, you mentioned the, um, you know, the schemes that we have put to board um, earlier in the year. We've got schemes that have been, you know, developed over a significant uh, period of time for which there's both great support, but also great demonstration of positive outcomes um, for those most in need in the city um, and it does seem as if we've been waiting an awful long time for things to get straightened out. Uh, I agree David, I think, I think some of this is in our, in, in our gift to go at risk on um, because we have been waiting a long period of time for guidance, haven't we? And we wouldn't ordinarily be in this position. I mean, we've had guidance late, but not this late uh, previously. But we, you know, we understand why why it's happened. It is very frustrating. Um, but if it if and, and of course we are still we are trying to learn from the process that we've been through as well, haven't we? Uh, so as long as we're taking that. Um, approach with everything and that it's clear that things still need to come into a committee before it go or a board before it um, before it gets approved then yeah yeah it you know that is a decision the board could make 
yeah. I mean, I think we should we should visit that very seriously. I mean, you know, we are quite rightly being implored to address the inequalities um, and the impacts um, of COVID, and we're we're being implored to get on with recovery measures. And that's not just about recovery within the NHS's um, systems. It's also recovery within our communities. Um, and yet, you know, we appear to be being held up mm -hmm. um, in, in that endeavor. And I think that is a, a huge shame and a, and a disservice to our, to, to our communities. Thank you, David. Uh, Alison. Oh, you're on mute, Alison. <laughs> so sorry. Um, I guess uh, I'd just like to uh, endorse what David's saying, really, and just say specifically in the context of the proposals for children's community nursing, what we've got is a coherent set of proposals for the whole um, Portsmouth and South East Hampshire patch. So. You know, this isn't something where Portsmouth is trying to strike out on it on its own. It's a it's a coherent thing done on the uh, hospital footprint, and indeed, it's a piece of system design which is designed to make the whole system resilient. So actually, it's the kind of thing which, at an ICS level, um, should be uh, sponsored, mandated, promoted, or whatever. You know, this is the kind of development that that we need to see from a forward-looking. ICS, so they should be your your colleagues in, in the ICS team should should be requiring us to to do this in my view. Um, so I just wonder whether there's an opportunity if we were running at risk to to really make that clear to colleagues that this is something where we we think we need to set the example rather than declare UDI. Mm -hmm. this, uh, and if I recall correctly, Alison, we did say that. Um, the cases that came were all uh, laudable and and mm. uh, and um, uh, backed by the by the board. So if if the board wants to say yes, let's get on with it, I think we we have the ability to do that. It's just that if we do that, it might mean that something else that might be as laudable comes along in two months' time. No, I, I I completely understand, which is why there needs to be some um, process, I guess, of fair and transparent consideration of, of these cases. But um, the, the one for children's nursing is complicated by the fact that it would be so much better if the uh, Hampshire Partnership CCGs were also agreeing. But they're in a similar situation of saying, this is all really good stuff, but we can't take a decision yet. Yeah. Um, so there's something for me about how, how do we advocate for a, a bit of running at risk on a wider footprint than just Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Alison. Uh, Michelle, is there anything else you wish to... Um, no, no, other than... So I can't quite hear you there. So is that B and D? Completed the reports on. Yes, yeah, the, I, I yeah. wrapped both reports in together. So That's good, yeah, yeah. That's um, when you read them, there, you know, you hopefully you'll see that there are similarities. It's just like to say, one's about the financial framework and the other is about the planning bits that mm -hmm. make up that big story. Yeah, okay, thank you. Jackie. And so, yeah, sorry, Andy, just to oh. say that, you know, that planning timetable isn't isn't just about Portsmouth, it's about how we're interacting with the uh, Portsmouth and South East Hampshire in particular, so that we're doing our planning uh, in tandem. So, yeah. That's good. Uh, Jackie, you had a question. Yeah, it was to pick up and try and clarify, um, I understood exactly what Alison was saying and also what you were saying, Michelle, is that we could run at risk with both of these two projects. So what I'm trying to get my head around is, what's the next step for those two projects? Do we as a board go, yes, we be want to go ahead with it? What, what are we waiting for that stops us moving forward? I think, uh, uh, Andy, Sorry. if you're content with that, respond to that. So I think, yeah. I think what the, where I am is if we as a board are saying these are the next there, there are definitely things that we need to go ahead with, um, and, and I'm going to widen that out probably to the discharge to assess program and the 111 first. Um, 
there are a couple of other little ones that now have escaped my head, other than Alison's um, children's one that she's, that she's mentioned. If those are the if those are the ones that we definitely know, that all it needs is for us to go. We need to be getting on with this, and we need to go at risk. Then, as long as the board is content with that approach, and we will try and. And ensure that we keep the financials as tight as we can around that. You know, noting that you know a, a number of these things are already up and running. So if you think about a discharge to assess program, because of COVID, we've got quite a lot of that open already, and it's about we need to make sure it it keeps going um, whilst we add to it. So um, if if the board wants to delegate that back out to the teams to get on with those part you know, those things that have already been presented, then we can make that happen. I'm choosing my words carefully to make sure. <laughs> I yeah. don't know if we can go off and spend as much money as we want. But we need to no, I hear you. within a controlled framework, uh, at, because we have got business cases that are all but in them, and we, we know that it's the direction of travel we want to go in, um, but we just haven't got that final over that final hurdle of let's get on with them. Okay. So is that, is that something we can do? I don't know, is this an, an extra meeting for the board to just go, yes, is there anything else that we want to look at? Go, 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 or can we make the decision now? I don't want to put anyone on the spot. I'm just trying to see away. Thank you. So it's about identifying a roadmap effectively in terms of using the next steps. Um, well, sorry, Andy, yeah. I was just going to come. Yeah, so I suppose the, the issue is back to what we were just saying about the other board. For some of these papers, they are, we all have to jump or it wouldn't work. So for the Portsmouth South East Sands Children's Specialist Nursing Service, we could go, we might be happy to go at risk, but I suppose unless our counterparts are as well, Alison, I don't know if you could do that change. There, there's a variant. There's a, there is a variant that's possible that's Portsmouth only. It's just that we don't really want to put the hospital no. in the position of um, checking children's postcodes when, and, and you know, the service operating differently. Um, so that's why I think it's really helpful if we can, if, if this board were to say, actually, this is the right thing to do, we should be doing it, then that, that view perhaps could be carried into the ICP decision-making executive um, uh, to to try and push this and say, come on, let's 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 make this happen, um, and and involve ICS colleagues as well, and saying actually you should be requiring the same level of uh, detailed development of an integrated, more flexible approach to children's nursing across the whole of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Mm -hmm. We know we've got a demography we need to serve here of increased numbers of children with complex care needs. We need to get have a good model. A lot of work's gone into this, so. And that's why I'm saying it's like uh, setting the example, blazing the trail. Um, but I, it would be much, much more helpful from the hospital if it could be done on a Portsmouth and South East Hampshire footprint. Mm. Uh, 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 absolutely. And, and I think it's they're really good examples of where we're all in the same hiatus, aren't we? So, you know, Fair and Gospel South East and the new CCG mm. are, are also struggling with. We, we all know that these are probably as good as ideas as we've got to progress um however we still don't have the financial regime that's that's sort of given us a certainty to to get on with it mm. well sorry to have another bite at this uh, chair but um michelle i guess a lot of this depends on how confident you are that all the green lights will be in place with the national systems by the time of our next board meeting. Um, I think if you're not confident that we can get everything through then, then I would suggest that we, you know, we do, um, you know, within parameters delegate um, from the board to, to make progress, as much progress as we can with our partners um, and accepting that there is a certain amount of risk um, associated to that. But otherwise, we just end up in status, don't we? Mm. I agree, David. Yeah, I would have liked to have been able to come and say, yeah, we can get on and do this, this, and this. But, um, uh, you know, if we're, con if we're all content to go at risk, then I think we, we can make that happen. Thank you. Graham. 
Thanks, Andy. I think mine's just a hybrid version, really, of what David was suggesting, so that we don't get caught in a, a static and appreciating next board meeting isn't till May as to whether we could, if, if colleagues were happy, um, devote a portion of the development session in April to this um, and perhaps bring so that we're looking at it holistically and not picking off individual pieces, um, bring those um, projects that we've agreed but which are holding on finance and have a, a, a sort of risk framework by which we want to um, you know, either press a green light or we want to continue to hold. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's helpful. Now, I suppose the other thing uh, for the board to be cognizant of is that my understanding of all the ones we've, we've seen are not just Portsmouth specific ones, they are uh, Portsmouth for South East Hampshire wide approaches as well. So it's not it's not something that we're trying to do um, in isolation. They're, I think mm -hmm. absolutely it, all of them, I think, we're doing in unison, yeah, because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Alison? Just a quick point, um, to the extent that we're looking at um, schemes in competition, as it might be really helpful if there's a common uh, framework. I think David has put that um, point in the chat, but as it's a public meet meeting in public, uh, it's really worth just articulating that. It's quite an important principle, isn't it, that we look at this, um, the schemes against a, a common set of criteria. Yeah, that's a good point, Alison. Thank you. Anything else from anybody? No? Okay, so for the purposes of the minutes of the financial framework and the planning approach, do we uh, agree to accept the contents of the reports? Yeah. Thank you. I'm getting nods there. That's good. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you, Michelle. That now brings us then on to item eight, quality and safeguarding updates. Karen, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah. You've got a, a report um, of sorts in odd that they, we certainly had a capacity issue within the quality and safety um, team. Um, so, uh, last month we didn't receive a report at all, so so this is at least something. We did the quality and safety committee did meet today, um, so I can update some of the, the, the things that are within the report. Um, PHU, uh, they remain under significant pressure as we know, um, although this is a cons um, cons constantly changing picture. We've got four um, risks um, aligned with PHU that haven't been refreshed for some time, quality risks that is, um, that we're going to need to look at. One of those, the first one is delays in assessment and treatment of planned care that we're all aware of. Um, as we saw from the performance report, the cancer weights uh, are looking uh, good, um, um, but there's obviously a lot of work to do around other weights. Um, but I guess what what as we were saying, that that will be addressed with the sort of re regional recovery plan. Um, but we'll need to look at that in terms of, of, of the risk, quality risk for that. The second one was around the emergency department and urgent care pathway. That still exists as a risk and quality perspective. Um, although we're hoping, but we haven't got the work, that the 111 first project um, will start to have a positive impact. Um, there was a risk around safeguarding, um, but the, the safeguarding team at PHU is now fully staffed, so that's something we're hoping that can come off the list. Um, and there was an issue around governance. We have got an emerging risk, um, well, we think we've got an emerging risk um, relating to a number of SIs um, within maternity services that the quality team are, are reviewing to see if it if there is actually a, a risk. Um, but there is some level of reassurance because they are um, starting an operational maternity surveillance group in April, which will start to pull things together um, more systematically. Um, and there's a new director and deputy director of maternity starting at um, PHU. So whilst we think there's a risk, we think that there, there may be some mitigation in place that will, will help to support some of that. Um, with regards to Solent, um, there's quite a, a lot of detail in the report, but just to say um, it's noted that there's increased demand, especially around um, for children and families. Um, the quality team acknowledged that there's 
increased demand. But what we're aware of is that there's also um, been increased investment in for council liaison services for winter pressure monies and also um, investment to support the neurodiversity waiting list. So we're hoping that uh, this will start to have an impact on, on um, the demand. So the quality team will continue to review that. With regards to SCAS, they're continuing to meet fortnightly with um, uh, CCG and, and they've moved to uh, REAP level one, which is a steady state last week. So that's looking positive at the moment. Um, PPCA, um, just to say that they've increased their numbers. It says in the report 51 patients on, on the COVID at home service. That's now 138, I think. So that's looking, um, that's quite active and positive. And with regards to the care homes, they now only have four um, care homes with COVID outbreaks and three of those are coming to the end. So that's a much better position. The issue for care homes, I think their current concern is that whilst we went through COVID, um, all of the care homes went on to NHS mail, which um, for us was really positive because it meant the, the transfer of confidential information, but also to do with um, pox medication or doing. Um, so that's something that we want them to continue. Um, but I think they, there's a need for them to do a sort of IG toolkit by the end of June. Um, and so a lot of the home keep, that's quite an extensive piece of work and requires quite a lot of resources that I don't think the care homes feel very confident to undertake. So we need to look at a way in which we can support the care homes to do this toolkit so that they can retain the NHS mail beyond June, I think. So that, that's quite an issue for care homes at the moment. Um, and finally, safeguarding. Within the CCG, we've just recruited uh, another safeguarding, um, into another safeguarding post, which is positive because that's been vacant for some time. They've started. Um, and Portsmouth are about to introduce a harmful practice strategic group, which will bring together um, uh, the um, FGM group and, and other sort of honour-based things um, uh, into one group and that's going to be chaired by the CCG's Director of Quality and Safeguarding. I think that's all I have to say in, in addition to what was in the report. Karen, thank you very much for that. It's, uh, very comprehensive and up to date. Uh, questions, comments from members? Graham? Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Karen. Um, Karen, on page three in Safeguarding, I know it refers that there's been unfortunately another homelessness death and that's going to be considered as part of the thematic review. Um, mm. But it does say that that's awaiting the allocation of an independent author, and I didn't know if that was becoming an issue and if there's anything that, if it is, if there's anything we can do to um, help with that. I didn't hear that it was this morning. It didn't get addressed at all this morning uh, at the meeting, so I'm, I'm guessing not, but I will check that to see if it is a, 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 an ongoing issue. Thank you. Simon, question. Hi, Karen. Um, Hi. Just on page four, um, it mentions the primary practice group. I think they're the Practice Plus group, which is now the rebranding of Care UK. But also, um, I just wanted to ask if there's any more information on what the situation with the Southampton UTC and who approached who about changing the DOS. Was it that it was a PPG that approached us about changing the DOS or? Did Southampton CCG approach us about changing the DOS just because this will impact 111 first and some of the work we do around that? I don't know the answer to that. I know that, that we have had been in discussions with them and I understood that we were saying that there wasn't compelling evidence to to go to under twos. I think we were retaining it at under one still. Is that would, would that mean true? So. Yeah, that I think that's what Portsmouth are still saying. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Jackie. Hello. Karen, Hi. thank you ever so much for this. And I completely endorse um, if the CCG or whatever wants to give support to care homes to fill out the IG toolkit form or assessment, because I know how difficult that is. Mm. So whatever mm. we can do, because the benefit of supporting them in that seems like it's quite, quite 
quite great. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I did note, and you did touch on, was the increased demand on CAMS and the increased demand on mental health services. And my focus with me is young people. And I'm wondering how the digital uh, offer that we give to, to young people is going, because that should be underpinning some of the CAM stuff so that the weights don't develop. So have we had any feedback? No, Jackie, we haven't. But I can certainly no. ask about that. No. Yes, please, because that's the underpinner, I think. That's yeah. the kind of the early intervention stuff that, in theory, should be kind of helping with CAMS. Yeah. And certainly it used to work like that. Um, yeah. And I, 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 I've tried to access the system myself, and the other tiny little tweet with it is that you have to sign in before you can see anything. And I'm not sure how appealing that is to young people. Yeah. That's my comment. So if I can get some feedback on that, I'd appreciate okay, it. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Alison. Well, just to comment briefly on that, I don't have figures immediately to hand, but um, I was... Um, given some a couple of weeks ago that were looking quite healthy actually that the the take up of Cooth, uh, the new digital young people's mental health services has, has been good you know people are, are are feeling very positive about that as as an important underlying preventative measure as exactly as you say Jackie um, but we are also still seeing that increased number of CAMS referrals which is a national picture um, and reflects the stresses on young people during lockdown actually. but um, if if it's helpful we can uh, I can certainly ask Anthony Harper to provide some up-to-date figures breakdown uh, of, of the take up oh, yes please because mm. I, I know there's be... others yeah sorry Andrew. No, I think we welcome Alison yeah it'd be useful to see given as you say the national picture and, and mm. uh, this, uh... sorry Jane just going to say that and of course there's other um organizations out there doing a very similar thing and i just wondered how they compare there's another one out there called the mix which is a very another very accessible digital online system the difference is you don't have to sign into that so i wondered if that is part of maybe i don't know if that affects young people or not actually that's just a query and maybe you'll get an answer when you get feedback thank you Thanks, Jackie. Okay. Uh, anything else for Karen? No? Okay. So we're asked to note the content of report, the report, the board, which I think we're doing with nods. So thank you for that. Uh, item 9 then is the Emergency Preparedness Resilience and Response Annual Report. David. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, it's been quite a year for this, obviously. Um, but I think it's a good, another good example of where um, Portsmouth CCG works closely with its partners across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight in terms of um, you know how we deliver our various responsibilities under the Civil Contingencies Act. Um, clearly, there are going to be a huge number of lessons um, learnt for us. But I think what's really um, encouraging, and you've got the report um, before you. Um, is that um, you know, notwithstanding the huge amount of effort that's gone into the COVID response, um, we've still managed to undertake a number of exercises, um, uh, both in terms of um, you know other types of contingency, um, but but we've also managed also to undertake a, a, a number of I think very valuable communications exercises as well, which is such a significant part of of, uh, of any public body's um, response to issues um, like this. Um, the, the the way in which we're structured around this, I mean, obviously we've got a lot of staff across our agencies who are heavily involved in this. But in terms of the uh, of the board representation, if you like, Sarah Tiller um, um, fulfills that role, including for ourselves. And I know, uh, Chair Andy, you are on the, the one of the independent um, uh, NEDs on, on uh, associated um, with that. Uh, and clearly, the directors of public health um, are hugely involved in this as well. Um, the the report sets out the activity that's been going on through the year. Um, it also draws out some early learning and lessons at uh, section 10 there. 
there will be a lot more on that. And I know, for example, that the local resilience forum um, is in the process of designing a debrief um, program um, to make sure that we do record our learnings um, from our experiences over the last um, 12 months. Um, you'll see at section 13 in the summary there that Portsmouth CCG uh, remains in its position of having um, substantial assurance um, but we all know that with this sort of thing it all depends on all the partners um, you know being uh, being in a strong position and all the partners operating well um, across boundaries um, as well so I think it's um, you know in, in the circumstances I think it's a very encouraging report it's there for the board um, to note um, there are a couple of uh, amended processes that have been um, highlighted and they're set out um, in in the paper um, but I don't think I have I mean there's an awful lot in that report but I don't think I've got anything else particularly um, to draw out to your attention but I'm very happy to to answer any questions um, that you've got thank you thank you David uh, Linda so mine's, it's, you know, it's a very good report and thank you for the effort that's gone into writing that. But um, mine's more about the future. So Sarah Tiller, as you said, was representing ourselves. Obviously, as the new CCG comes online on the 1st of April, do we know what the arrangements are moving forward and whether we are going to be fully part of that or not? I don't think we do know just yet, Linda, but I think that, you know, we, we will be, I, th I think it would be good for us to keep in tandem um, you know, we, we, with Sarah and colleagues across Portsmouth South East Hans, um, and we'll need to engage, uh, you know, obviously with the ICS um, and the other um, CCG for, for that transitional uh, period. Um, but, you know, I'm sure that it's not beyond the wit of man, certainly won't beyond the wit of woman, uh, to come up with a, an effective solution for, for dealing with this in a collaborative way. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, uh, and thank you for the report, David. I, I can confirm I saw the I think it was the minutes of the LRF executive group meeting, uh, which took place this week, and there is an agenda item for all CCGs to, to look at the whole picture yeah. with regards to CCGs in the NHS across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. And a piece of work has been commissioned to ensure that they are integrated back into the LRF, as David says, to ensure that that connection is maintained. Um, and, and I'd like to also echo David's comments, a very good report and the amount of hours and hard work, as much as you can plan for an event, as much as you can exercise for an event, when a pandemic comes along, it suddenly takes a lot out of everybody, and very much as it did in this case, but everybody stood firm and did a terrific job across uh, all of the agencies, it really was a good, a good example of interoperability and multi-agency approach to dealing with a significant national and localised issue. It was carried out very, very well, and I look forward to, to seeing what they what they learn from it and how they can improve. But they did a great job. And that's uh, that's good to see. Okay, uh, next item then is the full register of interests for all staff. Um, it's basically uh, the register that we can see that has the details of all those <coughs> the register of interests that has details of all individuals working for or on behalf of the CCG who sit in a decision-making decision, decision -making, um, committee, uh, includes members, regular attendees, the Ministry of Support, uh, and what we're asked here is to review the attached staff register of interest, and if there are any comments, please raise your hand now. Okay, that's good, so we can accept that as a valid document, so thank you for that. Item 11 then is the minutes of other meeting, and these are for noting. So first are the minutes of the Primary Care Commissioning Committee, held on the 26th of November. This meeting the minutes have been published and agreed. And the second one are the minutes of the Health and Wellbeing Board, held on the 25th of November, which again been published and agreed. Okay. I'll take us then to the next item, which is the date and time of the next meeting in public. Uh, the next governing board meeting will be held in public. It will take place on Wednesday, the 18th of May at 2pm. 
and will again be streamed online via Microsoft Teams for the benefit of all. Uh, before closing, I would like to thank Innes Richens, uh, who's been a valued member of our board, <coughs> covering both PCC uh, and NHS CCG work in his adult care uh, role. He's been wholeheartedly supportive of everything that we do in Portsmouth. He's worked hard to ensure that all the residents, citizens and patients that live in the great city have been well looked after. And I think I can speak on behalf of all of us in thanking him for all his efforts uh, during his time with us. And he really has been a first class, first class person in helping us all out with, with anything we ever needed help with and understanding how things work. Uh, and my, my best wishes, which I'm sure you'll agree, forwarded to him for his good future. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that now brings the meeting to a close. So I want to thank you all for your attendance. Uh, thank you to all those who have managed to uh, log in and watch. Uh, and I'll ask that the meeting streaming be brought to an end so as we can formally close the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Recording stopped. Thank you very much. Thanks we had me. confirmation from Democratic Services that it stopped. Sorry. I'm just doing that now. Oh. One moment, please. Oh, sorry. Lovely. Hold on, Thank please. you. The bar come up on mine. Sorry, that was my recording, which is the backup, and it's the oh. streaming that we need to confirm that stopped. Thank you, Jane.